Is Archbishop Vigano on the brink of schism? Recent article written by Sandro Magister in Italy accused Archbishop Vigano of that, asking, is Vigano on the brink of schism? We've been seeing this a lot. This is kind of the new card that people pull out. It's their Joker card, their Trump. Oh, you're a schismatic. Taylor Marshall, he's a schismatic. He's in the schism. He left the church. Vigano's a schismatic. Schneider's a schismatic. Cardinal Burke's a schismatic. Anyone you don't like is a schismatic. If you have any disagreement at all with the Pope, you're schismatic. I mean, Apostle Paul might have been schismatic. That's the rhetoric. So today we're going to go through Archbishop Vigano's response to Sandro Magister. It's epic. It's beautiful. One of the things I like is he refers to Vatican II as a container. A container. Last time he spoke of Vatican II as an event. It's not just documents. It's an event. Now he's using the language of container. And he goes through the accusations. Another accusation that was thrown at him before we pray is that Vigano is now anti-Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, And we've seen this happening too. Oh, you don't like Francis. Well, that means you're against, and you list it, Benedict, John Paul II, etc. So I think Archbishop Vigano did a great job on this. Um, I think I like Sandro Magister. Uh, I like his stuff, but I think he was a little bit out of line, and I think Vigano said it straight. So we are going to begin now. I'm going to begin in prayer. We'll put, pray together the uh, Pater Noster, the Our Father, and we'll get this thing started. Oremos. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panum nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et emite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. And Almighty God, we pray that none of us would ever leave the ark of salvation. None of us would ever commit the mortal sin of schism. None of us would leave communion with Rome, the apostolic see, that we would never break from the true vicar of Christ, the successor of St. Peter. And we also offer our prayers for Archbishop Vigano and for everyone watching that you would bless us and draw us close to the sacred heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right. Archbishop Vigano, is he on the brink of schism? No, of course he's not. Before we get started, I just want to ask everyone, please, pretty please, hit that like button, thumbs up. It's a big help. But the most important thing, as you know, is to share this video. Please hit the share button next to the thumbs up. If you're on mobile, it's right below me. If you're on a computer, it's down towards the right. Hit that share button and share this video on Facebook because there's a lot of fake news. Let's get the word out. Please share the video. And if you're new, please subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell and you'll be notified. I am live right now. And to be notified when I go live, you have to subscribe and hit the bell. So please do so. All right, let's get started. So Archbishop Vigano uh, just put out this response to Sandro Magister. I'm going to ask. I put it in the notes below. The text of Archbishop Vigano that I'll be following today, I'd ask the moderators over in the live chat if they could also now link that so that you can follow along with me because the text is very important. I'm going to read most of it, not all of it. I'm going to try to just glean and get the best parts of it. It's all good. Everyone should read the whole thing, but there are some choice parts. Now, for perspective, Sandra Magister is a well-respected Vatican journalist, and uh, like I said, I like him. He does really good work, but I've been kind of perplexed and I've seen this happening. Maybe, you know, honestly, maybe it's been happening since Archbishop Vigano wrote President Trump. That really ticked people off. It's like, okay, you're going to say something. You're going to say something about Pope Francis, but now you're going to write to Trump. Well, that's just too far, Vigano. We're going to come after you. The powers that be are going to come after you, Archbishop Vigano, and we're going to pull out scary words like schismatic and say that you're a schismatic. Now, what is a schismatic? Thomas Aquinas says that schism is a mortal sin. It's worse than heresy. Heresy is a sin against the faith. It comes from the Greek word meaning I choose. 
That's what heresy means. I choose. It's cafeteria Catholicism. I choose to believe in the Trinity, but I don't choose to believe in the church's teaching on abortion and contraception. Picking and choosing is heresy, and that's a crime against faith, the virtue of faith. But schism is a crime against charity. There's the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And charity is the highest. Charity is the highest. Because you can have the true faith, but if you don't have charity, St. Paul says, you can't be saved. You won't go to heaven. You have to have all three, faith, hope, and charity. Schism is a crime and a sin, mortal sin, against charity. It's saying, here's the true church. There's only one true church of Jesus Christ. And I am going to get out my scissors, my schizzers, and I'm going to cut myself off from that fellowship. And the bond of our fellowship is love. It's charity. And we are the ligaments that hold us all together is love and charity. It's safeguarded by the Holy Ghost. So when you take out your scissors, schism, schizzers, and you cut yourself off, you're saying, I don't love the fellowship of God's people. That's why it's such a grave sin, worse than heresy. So if you go around and you say Vigano's a schismatic or anyone, you better be sure. You better be sure. People all the time call me a schismatic outside the church. It's not true. I went to the fraternity of St. Peter two days ago. I'm in the bosom of the church. Not perfect. I'm a sinner. Go to confession often as I can. But I am in the one true church, the ark of salvation. So, didn't say he was in schism, but he's on the brink. He's got one foot off. If we're looking at Noah's ark, it's almost like he's doing the Leonardo DiCaprio. He's on the front. He's kind of hanging out. He could go over any time and be outside the Catholic Church. So, Archbishop Vigano, being Archbishop Vigano, does not let any time pass he Im immediately issues a missive, an epistle, and a letter. And that's what we're going to go over today because not only does it defend his honor and his name, but it also clarifies some things. And I think it brings new things to the conversation, especially as it regards Vatican II. What we've seen in the past year is an expansion of the focus. 2016, it was Francis. And then in 2019, it began to widen up. We realized there's more going on here. And then, if you read my book, Infiltration, you saw, oh, whoa, this is, this is a really big story. This is, this is not just an episode. This is in like an epic saga of heretics, Freemasons, schismatics, real ones, entering in as wolves dress up like sheep and corrupting faith and corrupting morals. And part of that debate and part of that story that's still with us today is what is Vatican II? What do we do with Vatican II? So with that, I'm going to turn to Archbishop Vigano's letter. And I'll ask the moderators, Daniel, Will, if you can link this up. Uh, I think the link that I'm providing is the uh, Marco Tassati link and the translation is by Giuseppe Pellegrino who's been doing a lot of the translations and we thank him for doing these English translations. Okay, so it begins, Dear Mr. Magister or Magister, permit me to reply to your article, quote, Archbishop Vigano on the brink of schism, published at Settimo Celi, Celo, sorry, on June 29th. So we're talking, this all happened within the last week. He says, I am aware of having dared to express an opinion strongly critical of the council. It is sufficient to awaken the in inquisitorial spirit that in other cases is object of execration by the right-thinking people. Nonetheless, in a respectful dispute between ecclesiastics and competent laity, it does not seem to me to be inappropriate to raise problems that remain unsolved or sorry, unresolved to date the foremost of which is the crisis that has afflicted the church since Vatican II and has now reached the point of devastation. Okay, so a few observations here. 
he talks about awakening the inquisitorial spirit. I have noticed as a Catholic, as a convert, that there are certain things that never receive an inquisitorial spirit. You can, you, a priest can get in a pulpit and say all religions are equal, all lead to heaven. A priest can say baptism does not remit original sin. We don't believe in original sin anymore. A priest can say the Holy Ghost is a female. All of, a priest can drop hosts on the ground. A girl can be an altar boy. All of these things are just sort of like, hmm. But if you raise your voice, if you ask a question about the sacrosanct Second Vatican Council, you are bad, you are schismatic, you cannot speak at this conference, you cannot be published at this publishing house, you cannot be on this radio show, because that is the sacrosanct holy cow. You cannot touch it. It is the only real dogma in 2020. Do you accept, without any reservations, Vatican II? There are people out there who are like, let's do LGBT, let's participate in prides, you know, priests are preaching about immigration or you got to wear your mask. No one cares. Hmm, no big deal. But if you say the kind of things that Vigano is saying, you're schismatic. It's bad. James Martin, yeah, he's a whatever. Jesuits, whatever. Vigano is bad. He's a schismatic. So it's the inquisitorial spirit that has been awakened. And he says, look, I don't think it's inappropriate to point out the obvious that our church has been in devastation since the 1960s. Baptisms down, ordinations down, calls, uh, vocations to the religious life, religious sisters down, 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 Catholic weddings down, birth rates down. Catholic schools, down. Don't even get me started on Catholic universities and Catholic colleges. Down, 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 secular, secular, liberal, liberal, liberal. So if that's been the case, why can't we talk about it? He says, I don't think it's inappropriate to raise the problems unresolved to this date. So far, so good. Moving on to that next second uh, paragraph. It's kind of big. He says, there are those who speak of a misrepresentation of the council, others who speak of the need to return to reading it in continuity with tradition, others of the opportunity to correct any errors contained in it or to interpret the equivocal points in a Catholic sense. So here he kind of lays out some positions. Basically, he's giving us the Pope Benedict hermeneutic of continuity. Before we get to that, one is just to say, well, the council was 100% awesome and orthodox. There's nothing wrong at all in the council. It's just been misrepresented by the spirit of Vatican II. It's kind of like the Mormon argument. The Mormons say, Christ, the 12 apostles were on point. They wrote the New Testament. And as soon as they died, the church just went AWOL and misrepresented everything the apostles wrote in the New Testament. And the church went dark and dim. It disappeared until Joseph Smith showed up and fixed it all. This is the idea that the council was perfect and awesome. And as soon as the council was over, this spirit of darkness and confusion entered. It had nothing to do with the council. Council's perfect, but then right after that, everything went bad. And then the other one is the Pope Benedict Hermeneutic Continuity. And that is, well, there are some questionable things in the council that maybe don't sound like previous popes and previous traditions, but we can interpret them in light of tradition. We can take a hermeneutic of continuity and we can interpret all of this so that the horse looks like the horse. You know what I'm talking about. If only I had it ready. Do I have my hermeneutic horse? Oh, darn. I always have them ready, but not today. All right, maybe the moderators can send me the horse. I thought I had it right here, but I don't. It's the picture of the horse that's beautiful on one end, and then it gets kind of childish. 
and not so artistic on the other end. Yeah, you can kind of make it all fit. But in reality, when you look at it and you read the story of the council, you realize there was weaponized ambiguity inside the council. Dan, you got the picture of the horse? I'd love to put the horse up. So he goes on to say, on the opposing side, there is no lack of those who consider Vatican II as a blueprint from which to proceed in the revolution. The changing and transformation of the church into an entirely new and modern entity in step with the times. This is part of the normal dynamics of a dialogue that is all too often invoked but rarely practiced. Okay, so he says, look, now there's also people who say there's a rupture. Vatican II created a new, an entirely new system, a new religion. And there are people out there who will say, well, yeah, I know that's what Catholics we used to believe. But now, since Vatican II, we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to believe that anymore. That's like James Martin. You can say, yeah, I know Pope Leo went out to fight, you know, to not fight, but to address Attila the Hun. I know St. Ambrose stood up to the Emperor Theodosian. I know that's what Catholics used to be. That used to be Catholicism. But now Vatican II tells us that the bishops don't have to do anything. That's the new Catholicism. All right, here's Dan, save the day. Here he is, the horse. The hermeneutic of continuity. It's a horse, you can, but you can tell one artist who started the horse is different than the artist who ended the horse. Technically, we can say, yeah, it's all in continuity, but in reality, we're looking at two different hands, two different artists, two different approaches to drawing a horse. The hermeneutic of continuity. Thank you, Dan. Dan, save the day. Everybody say thanks, Dan, in the live chat. Okay, so continuing on, he says, and notice he calls Vatican II a blueprint. This is pretty, this is pretty strong. This is strong words. He then goes on to say, those who thus far have expressed dissent about what I have said have never entered into the merit of the argument, limiting themselves to saddling me with epithets that have already been merited by my far more illustrious and venerable brothers in the episcopate. We're also seeing this more and more. Those of us who respectfully say, well, yeah, but is that in Vatican II? Uh, is that in continuity with previous magisterium? The, these 25 popes said the death penalty is moral, and then Francis says it's inadmissible. Is that in continuity? And what do they do? They throw epithets at us ad hominem. They don't enter in to discussion, theological discussion, like the great scholastics did, Bonaventure, Thomas Aquinas. Then Vigano says, it is curious that both in the doctrinal as well in the political arena, the progressives claim for themselves a primacy, a state of election, that apodictically places the adverse adversary in a position of ontological inferiority, unworthy of attention or response, and simplistically liquid, liquid, liquidable, liquidable, not a word I knew before, as Lefevrian, or as we would say probably in English, Lefevrite, on the ecclesiastical front or fascist on the socio-political front. This is exactly what happened when I respectfully last year Ask for a discussion with Bishop Barron on Dare We Hope and Honoré de Lubac and Nouvelle Théologie. He deleted my request on Facebook and then elsewhere he said, I'm not giving him a platform. Have you seen his book? Contempt. This is what we're up against. If you say, mm, I'm not so sure about this trajectory of Pope Francis and Pacha Idols, or, mm, I'm not so sure about the language of subsistent in, in Lumen Gentium. Or, I'm not so sure about what Vatican II teaches about uh, religious liberty and that pagans and idolaters have a right to worship in a false way and in a false religion. Oh, well, you're a Lefevrite. 
you're a set of a contest. You're a schismatic. Or in the political front, you're a fascist. You're a Nazi. And so Vigano makes a good point here. It's not just in politics. It's also in the church. They're going to pull the Nazi card on us, but it's not. It's Lefebvreite, schismatic, sede. Isn't Marshall a sede? No, I'm not a sede. <laughs> I'm not. But what they want to do is put their adversary, in the words of Vigano, in a position of ontological inferiority. Before the debate even begins, you have to be tarred and feathered. Vigano goes on to say, but their lack of arguments does not legitimize them to dictate the rules, nor to decide who has the right to speak. So you can delete our messages, but guess what? Vigano has a computer and he can write letters. They can get retweeted on Twitter. They can get posted on Facebook. You can say that I'm a schismatic or a but I'm on YouTube. And I can come on and say, no, I'm not. And here's why. I am a loyal son of the Holy Church. And I will never leave. God willing, with his grace. So they don't want to give us the right to speak. And he says, especially when reason, even prior to faith, has demonstrated where the deception is, who the author is, and what the purpose is. I'm going to skip the next paragraph. It's a little bit uh, more personal and get back to the argument. I'm at the paragraph now, if you're following along. He says, You state that I have supposedly blamed Benedict XVI for having deceived the whole church and that he would have it be believed that the Second Vatican Council was immune of heresies and moreover should be interpreted in perfect continuity with true perennial doctrine. Vigano says, next, next sentence, I do not think that I have ever written such a thing about the Holy Father. On the contrary, I said and I reaffirm that we are all or almost all deceived by those who use the council as a container equipped with its own implicit authority and the authoritativeness of the fathers who took part in it while distorting its purpose. So he's like, I never said that Benedict was out to deceive the whole church. In fact, if you've read all of Viganos' letters, and I have read all of them, you know that he says himself, I was deceived. I was confused. I was part of this system. I just trusted that we all, it looks like the hermetic, this horse. It looks different, but everyone's saying it's not. So let's just go along with it. He then says, and those who fell into this deception did so because loving the church and the papacy, they could not imagine that in the heart of Vatican II, I'm a minority of very organized conspirators could use a council to demolish the church from within. Did he use the word conspirators? Is this a conspiracy theory? That's what people say. Oh, Taylor Marshall, he went crazy. He wrote that book, Infiltration. He's a conspiracy theorist now. He's crazy. He thinks that there are evil cardinals, bishops, priests, even deacons and religious, that there are Jesuits in the church who don't believe the true faith and are using their position to undermine Catholics. Taylor Marshall made up that conspiracy theory and he's on the internet telling people they're falling for it. They too believe that there are evil cardinals in the church who are undermining faith and morals. This conspiracy, well, guess what? There are conspirators. There are men and women, nuns, who have snuck in to the sacred church of Jesus Christ and have undermined faith and morals. You all know it. If you've been Catholic for more than one year, you know it. You've seen it. It's in every diocese on planet Earth. A conspiracy theory is sort of a pejorative. But let's be honest. There are conspirators who are in the church right now. And they are undermining what we believe. We believe everything taught by Jesus Christ, his holy apostles, the popes, and all the councils of the church for 20 centuries. We hold to that. And if we see something that doesn't seem to fit, Vigano says, hey, we have a right, even lay people under Canon 212 to say, 
I don't think this fits. Help me understand this. I don't, I, it just doesn't fit. Oh, well, you're a schismatic now. No, you can't play that game anymore. That's over. Also, Vigano says, who could use a council to demolish the church from within. It's a plot to destroy the church from within. He goes on, and that in doing so, they could count on the silence and inaction of authority, if not on its complicity. These are historical facts of which I permit myself to give a personal interpretation, but one which I think others may share. So now he's going to get a little personal. Vegan no. I, per I permit myself also to remind you, as if there was any need, that the positions of the moderate rereading of the council in a traditional sense by Benedict the Sixteenth are part of a laudable recent past. While in the formidable seventies, the position of then theologian Joseph Ratzinger was quite different. Authoritative studies stand alongside the same admissions of the professor of Tübingen, confirming the partial repentances of the emeritus. So he's saying, look. Ratzinger, when he was a young theologian, was kind of a little bit on the left, left wing of things. And he's had partial repentances as Pope and as emeritus. He goes on to say, Nor do I see a reckless indictment launched by Vigano against Benedict XVI for his failed attempts to correct conciliar excesses by invoking the hermeneutic of continuity. Since this is an opinion widely shared not only in conservative circles, but also and above all among progressives. And it should be said that what the innovators succeeded in obtaining by means of deception, cunning, and blackmail was the result of a vision that we have found later applied in the maximum decree of the Bergoglian Magisterium of Amoris Laetitia. This next quote is golden. You ready for it? Here he goes. Vigano. The malicious intention is admitted by Ratzinger himself. So Vigano is saying, look, I'm not making up First of all, I'm not saying these evil things about Benedict. And he goes, and furthermore, these are things that Benedict himself has recognized as Pope. He goes on, the impression grew steadily. This is Ratzinger. He's quoting Ratzinger. The impression grew steadily that nothing was now stable in the church, that everything was open to revision. More and more, the council appeared to be like a great church parliament that could change everything and reshape everything according to its own desires, end quote. So Ratzinger says that the council appeared like a great parliament. Everything was up for grabs. Then Vigano goes on to say, but even more so by the words of the Dominican Edward Schilbex, quote, we express it diplomatically now but after the council, we will draw the implicit conclusions, end quote. I quote that quote in my book, Infiltration, because it shows the conspiracy. These are conspirators. He says, Shilbex, you've heard me say, you got to have the Shilbex to pay the Billabex in Vatican II. A Dominican who should be trained at Aquinas says that in the council, they did things diplomatically, but later they would draw implicit conclusions. Weaponized ambiguity was built into the cake. So Vigano does a good job here, he does his homework. He quotes Benedict, and then he quotes Schilbex, and then he goes on. He says, we have confirmed the internal, I'm sorry, we have confirmed that the intentional ambiguity in the text had the purpose of keeping opposing and irreconcilable visions together in the name of evaluation of utility and to the detriment of revealed truth, a truth that, when it is integrally proclaimed, cannot fail to be divisive, just as our Lord is divisive. Quote, Do you not think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. St. Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Vigano then says, I do not find anything reprehensible in suggesting that we should forget Vatican II. Its proponents knew how to confidently exercise this damnatio memoriae, not just with the council, but with everything, even to the point of affirming that their council 
was the first of a new church. And that beginning with their council, the old religion and the old mass was finished. Wow. Is he not right? Is Vigano not right? They believed in a new mass, a new Pentecost, a new springtime, a novus ordo misae. They rewrote the liturgy for all seven sacraments, a new breviary, a new everything, new architecture, new felt banners, new music, new, 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 new. Everything was new. And then there was the old religion of great grandma. Bad. Old ladies in the backs of church lighting candles and mumbling rosaries while the men stood outside and smoked cigarettes. No one believed anything. It's just this broken system of rigor and hypocrisy. And then came the council. Everything was renewed. Everything was good. The church was going to explode. Everyone was going to run to the Catholic church now that it was in the vernacular. And the liturgy was more feel-good and more Protestant. And the music sounded more like the monkeys and Peter, Paul, and Mary and the birds. Everyone was going to run into the church. And guess what? They didn't. The pews began to empty. Vocations went down down adult baptisms and conversions to the church down even infant baptisms down because the old religion was catholicism and they tried to change it vigano goes on to say you will say to me that these are positions of extremists and that virtue stands in the middle that is, among those who consider Vatican II is only the latest of an uninterrupted series of events in which the Holy Spirit speaks through the mouth of the one and only infallible magisterium. If so, it should be explained why the conciliar church was given a new liturgy, a new calendar, and consequently a new doctrine. And then he coins this, I've never seen this done before, Latin phrase. Usually you've seen lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of faith. But he says... Nova Lex Arande, Nova Lex Credendi. The new law of prayer is the new law of belief. Well done, Vigano. Genius. He goes on to say, the mere idea of setting the council aside causes scandal, even in those like you who recognize the crisis of recent years, but who persist in not wanting to recognize the causal link between Vatican II and its logical and inevitable effects. We're getting closer to the end here. A couple more quotes. Sorry, I lost my place. Here it is. You write, he's talking to Sandro here. Attention, not the council interpreted badly, but the council as such and in block. I ask you then, what would be the correct interpretation of the council? Vigano asks. The one you give? or the one given while they wrote the decrees and declarations by its very industrious architects. Or perhaps the German Episcopate, maybe their interpretation, Vigano said, this is me, maybe we go to the Germans and say, well, tell us what Vatican II means, Vigano says, or that of the theologians who teach at the pontifical universities and that we see published in the most popular Catholic periodicals in the world. Or is it that of Joseph Ratzinger? Or is it that of Bishop Schneider? Or is it that of Bergoglio? Which would be enough to understand how much damage has been caused by the deliberate adoption of a language that was so murky that it legitimized opposing and contrary interpretations on the basis of which the famous conciliar springtime then occurred. Vigano then says, this is great, you ready? Vigano, quote, This is why I do not hesitate to say that the assembly should be forgotten as such and in block. Now, I'm going to pause here and say, I don't necessarily fully agree with Vigano on this. I'm still working this out. I like what Bishop Schneider says. Maybe there's a way, a middle ground on this. I don't know. But I do like the way that he's systematically going through it. He's making the case of Vatican II as an event. It's a container. And that's why it should be forgotten as such and in block. And 
if I could talk to Vigano, I'd say, what do you mean by forgotten? Does this mean scratched from the apostolic, the, the acts of the apostolic see? Does it just mean we all corporately just say, forget this? That's one thing I'd like to learn from Vigano when he says forgotten. Vigano then says, and I claim the right to say, say it without thereby making myself guilty of a delict of schism for having attacked the unity of the church. The unity of the church is inseparably in charity and in truth. And where error reigns or even only worms in its way, there cannot be charity. Then he says, the fairy tale of the hermeneutic, even though an authoritative one because of the author, nevertheless remains an attempt to want to give the dignity of a council to a true and proper ambush against the church. So as not to discredit along with the popes who wanted, imposed, and reproposed that council. So much so that these same popes, one after another, rise to the honor of the altar for having been popes of the council. And this is a little cheeky here by Archbishop Vigano. He's taking a little jab. He's saying, look, uh, I know popes, you know, repropose the council. And isn't it interesting that they've all been canonized by Pope Francis? Paul VI, JP2, JP1 on the way. Maybe. Benedict? Maybe he's on the way too. But that's just a little cheeky comment. Like, oh wow, we haven't had popes canonized since Pius V in the 1500s and Pius X in the early 1900s. And now we're canonizing John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, John Paul II. At the very end of the letter, we come to the end here. He says, I continue to hope that the tone of your article was not uh, dictated by the simple fact that I have dared to reopen the debate about the council that many, too many, in the ecclesial structure consider as a unicum in the history of the church, almost an untouchable idol. Ooh, he, Vigano said that. You may be certain that, unlike many bishops, such as those of the German synodal path, who have already gone far beyond the brink of schism, promoting and brazenly attempting to impose aberrant ideologies and practices on the universal church, I have no desire to separate myself from Mother Church for the exaltation of which I daily renew the offering of my life. What did, what did Vigano just do there, everyone? He said to Sandro, oh, you're after me on the brink of schism. What about the German bishops who are teaching daily heresy? In an official way, the German synodal path, who have, he says have already gone far beyond the brink of schism. This is the double standard right now in Catholicism 2020. James Martin, Slim Jim, Jesuits, the superior of the Jesuits, German bishops. Yeah, they're a little misguided, kind of kind of heretical, but you know, that's the church. That's the church right now. Vigano, oh, he's a schismatic. He, he doesn't love the Holy Father. He's bad. You see the double standard here. And I like that Vigano is a little bit cheeky to throw that in at the very end of Sandro. And then, in closing, I got to mention this. Vigano mentions the prayer that's recited at the end of low mass for the conversion of Russia. He gives it in Latin. I'll read you the English. If you go to traditional Latin Mass, low Mass, you've heard this prayed before. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down with favor upon thy people who cry to thee, that through the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of her spouse, blessed Joseph, of thy holy apostles, Peter and Paul, and all the saints, mercifully and graciously look, or sorry, mercifully, mercifully and graciously hear the prayers which we pour forth to thee for the conversion of sinners and for the liberty and, and exaltation of Holy Mother the Church through the same Christ our Lord. And then he says, Receive, dear Sandro, my blessing and greeting. Best wishes for every good thing in Christ Jesus. Carlo Maria Vigano. Wow, wow, wow. So just a couple uh, observations in conclusion before I sign off here. Uh, the first is, I liked that Vigano's raising the question, Schneider's raising the question, even Burke and Brandmuller have raised the question. Others have kind of entered the fray, but not in any like systematic way. 
I think these four men have actually put out public record and said, here are our problems. Cardinal Mueller, a little bit, all right, but not as much uh, as Vigano and Schneider. It's an interesting conversation. Even if you disagree with Vigano and you say, no, I want to take a more of a line item veto. I like to remove troubling parts out of Vatican II. This was done at the Council of Constance. It was done at uh, the Council of Constantinople when there was a decree that said um, that Constantinople would be the new Rome and second in rank. The Pope did not accept that. He, even though it was in the council, he ejected it. So there are, uh, Hake Sancta also was a document that was ejected from conciliar documents. The popes can do that. So that's one thesis. That's how I've always understood it um, with Vatican II. Vigano is going a little bit more radical here. Um, but I like the conversation. And I like the fact that he's bringing up the explicit elements. And that is there were conspirators at the council. There was ambiguities placed in there. We have, we all need to say there is problems with Vatican II. And then we try to find a solution. He is bringing it out and he's not, he's not flinching when they call him a schismatic. He's saying, no, I'm a true son of the church, but we need to fix this because look around, devastation. We are in devastation. We had idols in St. Peter's Basilica in October of 2019. Idols, pagan idols of Mother Earth. Not the Virgin Mary. Pope even said not the Virgin Mary. The Vatican said Mother Earth indigenous Amazonian idols were paraded and placed in St. Peter's. That has never happened in the Catholic Church. And it's done when you challenge it. Oh, well, Vatican II said ecumenical, you know, ecumenism and all that. You know, it's just Vatican II, so go away because that's schismatic if you don't like it, ecumenical. That's the problem. All right, well, there it is. Thank you so much uh, for watching, everyone. If you like the video, please like the video. Hit the thumbs up. I appreciate that. Please um, share the video on Facebook. And uh, if you're new, subscribe, like I said in the beginning of the show. Also, there are highlights. Daniel, who came to the rescue with our Hermeneutic Continuity horse, he curates the Dr. Taylor Marshall highlights show. Those are short clips. So this is a 42-minute video. He'll cut down maybe a couple pieces of this video into like two-minute, three-minute, six-minute clips and label them so you can get bite-sized pieces if you want. And then thanks to everyone who supports on Patreon. Uh, signed a bunch of books, and there's so many people supporting now, we're a little bit backlogged. So it may be... Um, more than a week if you've signed up as a patron at patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Usually it takes about a week for me to send out books and merchandise and all kinds of stuff to say thank you. Uh, maybe a little bit longer and I apologize. I'm sorry for that. Well, thanks so much for watching everyone. We're going to pray now. We're going to pray the Ave Maria and the Gloria Patri and then I'm going to remind you to pray the Rosary every day. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria. Gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu molieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et or mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Santo, sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we don't know the way out. There is confusion, and we ask that you would be the good shepherd and lead us into all truth, because you are the way the truth, and the life. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. And then pray the rosary every single day. I'm so excited. There's been a huge surge now in rosary prayers. I'm getting comments. I'm getting all kinds of notes, uh, direct messages, tweets. Hey, I'm praying the rosary now. Awesome. I'm on the team. I'm praying the rosary. It's changing my life. Uh, I've had people write me, I was addicted to porn. I started praying the rosary. I'm, I'm finding freedom. Uh, my husband and I are now praying the rosary together every night. It's changing our marriage. I'm praying the rosary. I'm thinking about a religious vocation. Isn't that amazing? When people pray the rosary, the Holy Ghost starts to work in people's life and bring healing and salvation. So pray the rosary every day. It's the weapon. Not only is it the weapon against the devil, it's also the healing bomb. It's going to give you the graces of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you're meditating and thinking about the life of Jesus. It's the Bible on beads. Pray the rosary every day. If you don't pray the rosary every day, you're just not on the team. And I know Archbishop Vigano would agree. Pray the rosary every 
single day. That's a show. Thanks for watching. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ said you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty till next time. God bless and Godspeed. Pray that rosary.